Um, this has happened to us a few times with this vehicle. At the place where Spirit has been exploring for the last couple of years, there are these treacherous, invisible rover traps <laughs> beneath the surface. There is a soil there, and it's related to the silica discovery that I mentioned to you. There's a soil there that is made of a mixture of silica and iron sulfate salts. Very, very interesting scientifically. We think it may result from volcanic fumaroles, where very hot steam, very caustic steam, has come out of the ground and, and changed the, the nature of the soil there. But one of the characteristics of this soil is that it's very, very low in cohesion. It doesn't stick together well. And when you spin the wheels in it, they just kind of spin and spin and spin. Now, if this stuff were right at the surface, wouldn't be a problem. We'd see it coming. It's bright white. But the problem is it comes almost all the way to the surface, and then there's this veneer of regular-looking Martian dirt on top of it. So it's camouflaged. You can't tell until you've gotten into it. So you get into the stuff, and the wheels start to spin. Now, if we had a six-wheeled rover, i.e., if all six wheels were working properly, I think we could just power our way out of this. But right now, Spirit is effectively a five-wheel rover. We have five good wheels. The right front wheel doesn't turn. It hasn't turned since like day 800 of the mission. And so we're dragging this dead wheel as we drive. And that makes it very difficult to get out of this stuff. We have wandered into this stuff three times now. We've gotten out of it twice. This is the third. This is the worst of the three circumstances. I do not know if we'll get out or not. But we think we're just about ready to start. We think we've got a plan, and we're going to give it a try and see what happens. Yeah, we saw about the water. Did you have any uh, evidence of water as it is here on Earth and any evidence of flowing water? OK. Uh, the, the question had to do was with, was the water like the water on Earth? First of all, there are places on Earth that you can go where you get very deep red water. If you go to the Rio Tinto in Spain, where the water is very acidic, it has that deep red color. And by the way, the deep red color is pure speculation on the part of the PI. I don't know if it was like that or not. Um, we do, what we do know is that the, the water at the Opportunity site was an acid brine. It was very acidic. It was very salty. Um, you have salty water all over the Earth. The oceans are salty. Different kind of salt. On Earth, it's chlorides. Here, it's, uh, on Mars, it's sulfates. Um, much more acidic than most of the waters on Earth. There are probably places on Mars where it was less acidic. Did the water come to the surface and flow across the surface? Definitely yes, because as the film mentioned, there are those little ripples that we see in places. How about right here in the red shirt? Can you uh, speak at all about the MSL and what that rover brings to the robotic exploration of Mars that your and uh, have not? Sure. The question is about the MSL rover, how it's different, uh, how it's better than uh, Spirit and Opportunity. It is a much larger vehicle, so it will be able to go over larger obstacles and probably cover substantially greater distances. Um, it has a nuclear power source instead of solar cells, so you don't have to mess around waiting for wind gusts to give you the power that you need. Uh, most excitingly to me, as a scientist, it has the capability to drill into rocks, depths of you know, 8 or 10 centimeters, and extract powder from those rocks and then put them into a very sophisticated suite of instruments that includes the capability for the first time to look for organic molecules inside the rocks on Mars. And organic molecules, of course, are the building blocks of life. So it really takes it really take the story of early Mars much, much farther than we were able to do as very an opportunity. Scheduled for launch in 2011. On the extreme right. Yes. The light on Mars itself. The, the best that I can tell you is this movie was very carefully vetted by Lockheed, by NASA, by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And by my science team. <laughs> and we were approved all the way through. But obviously, we had to take some liberties in making a film. There is no sound in space, for instance. 
the rover is m moving the equivalent of 100 miles an hour on Mars. <laughs> but um, everything beyond what we needed poetic license to make in the film has been very carefully vetted. I'd like to say w one other thing right now. Pumping Orin may sound like a silly movie back from the 70s, but it had an enormous influence. 100,000 gems opened up around the world after that film came out. And I like to put my tongue in my cheek and say that it caused more cash flow than Star Wars. <laughs> but I, and it did in that case, because Arnold became a billionaire. The Wiener Brothers became billionaires and bodybuilding became a 70 or 80 billion dollar a year business. The, the point I'm trying to make here is that I believe I'm standing in front of an advocacy society that would like much more action on Mars. And one way of doing this is to get films like this screened in audiences all over the world. And you would be very pleasantly surprised what a film like this can do. I am working on the Morris Science Lab film. We've, we're going to do it in 35 millimeter, not IMAX. It'll be two hours long. And it's going to dive into the mission and go through with great detail. And I, it's going to hit a completely different audience from this film. And these are things that can really change people's minds. One other example is that we've literally made Shackleton famous around the world with our Shackleton films. In 1999, when I started that project, very few people would have known about Shackleton. And these movies are powerful. And if you combine a movie with casting like Steve Squires, you get a very powerful <laughs> message out there. Next question. In the very back. Uh, Sir. I, I want to preface my question by saying I love the film. I bought it. Uh, I've seen it uh, a number of times. I have a, a, a faint uh, amount of misgivings, though, about just how good the effects are. I'm not too worried about that. I've always said that my films and very good films should take people to a place that they cannot imagine. And our young animator, Dan Mass, who's 20, who's 24 years old when he did this, is by my estimation a kind of genius. And I'm very, very determined to work with him again. You may laugh about this. But I've got 8,000 photographs of Arnold Schwarzenegger that I <coughs> took over a 10 year period between about 1972 and 82. And I read in The New Yorker two weeks ago that someone had taken still photographs of Nijinsky, the great ballet dancer, and animated them and turned them into a film. And right now, I'm thinking as quickly as I can about how to take those 8,000 photos <laughs> with all rights that I acquired and turn it into a two-hour film on Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> and I observe that the budget in his films is about 200 million, so maybe Hollywood will give me some big money this time. <laughs> this right here. On a lot, lot of films at the bottom of the crater, how do we know that the channels were carved by water instead of lava? How do we know the channels on Mars were carved by water instead of lava? There are a number of lines of evidence that point, I think, pretty conclusively in that direction. Yes, lava can car carve channels. Yes, water can carve channels. But there tend to be distinctive morphologic differences between the two. Uh, for 